morning everyone and welcome to this week's Sunday Online. Whether you're joining us from Skylark Church in Chelmsford, from our Skylark International family or from further afield, we hope you feel really welcome as we gather together online today. I'll be back at the ends to share some brief updates, some of the things that we've been doing this week to bless our city and our community and some of the important things to highlight that are coming up on the horizon for us as a church family. So do join me at the end again for that. But for now, I'd love to introduce our speaker this morning. Pete Sims is a man who needs very little introduction because his life and his love for Jesus speak for themselves. So do open your hearts because I know that what he has to share this morning is really important. Over to you, Pete. Good morning, everyone. Do you remember a few years back, we were talking about the ripple effect in church and that is loving God, loving ourselves, loving our neighbor, loving our community and our world and how it needs to ripple out from us to the ends of the earth. And I spoke about what it means for us as a church family to love each other. I use the analogy of hitting a thumb with a hammer. Now that sounds strange. So let me explain that story again. Imagine I'm holding a nail and here I am hammering that nail into the wall to put a beautiful picture up and suddenly you get that dull thud, which wasn't the sound you were expecting. What is it that we all do at that moment? What I've seen us do is this, and what I know I do is protect. And what I'm doing here is I'm using another part of my body to surround the bit that hurts and pulling it close to the centre. I've seen it with people who've broken, say, their wrist when I used to be a PE teacher. If someone breaks their wrist, their natural reaction is to protect the broken bit and to pull it close to the centre. They don't leave it out here to the side. They pull it close and protect. And this part, this hand, will protect this wrist if someone gets too close. What's happening today in society is that part of our church family, our beautiful black church family, many of them are hurting. And what we say that we will do as a church family around them is to gather round, protect, hold them close to the centre, not leave them out on the edges on their own, but we will stand together and look after each other. This little picture is so important right now. Nikki and I put a statement out on Facebook during the week, which some of you may have seen, some of you may have not, so I'd like to read it to you now. As a church family, we stand together as one against the systemic racism experienced by black people generation after generation across the world and here in the UK. We are grieving with so many who have suffered and continue to suffer the pain of injustice and oppression. To our black brothers and sisters within the Skylark family and across the world, we are standing with you. We see you. We affirm you. We are listening to you. We will speak out and seek justice with you. We love you. Where we have been blind, where we have hurt you and where we have not understood, we are sorry. We are praying and asking God to search our hearts, change us and awaken us to take action. We will lift our voices alongside yours in the pursuit of justice, freedom and lasting change. As you are in pain, we want you to know that we are surrounding you and we're holding you close. Do you remember our justice series back last year? We spoke for a couple of months in church on justice and many people thought, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do? And we said at the time that it was going to be much more than a series. It was going to be a departure point for God to change us, to change his church and to use us to act and to advocate for change. The abhorrent killing of George Floyd and the ensuing groundswell of grief, anger and pain have heightened once again the racial injustice that has been woven into the fabric of our society for generations. 
and which is still operating systemically across our world to oppress and discriminate against people from black and minority ethnic groups. To follow Jesus is to be an apprentice. How do we follow him well when it comes to standing against racism? Nikki and I are on a journey. We don't have all of the answers. Our leadership team don't have all of the answers. But we do want to walk forward and take the church forward with us on a journey as we seek to follow Jesus and bring about lasting change, both internally and externally. We are being called to be Jesus followers who are advocates, who find a voice to speak up against some of the injustices that we see in the world around us. The strapline for the network is that we are people who rebuild ruins, who build bridges and create culture. Rebuilding ruins into systems and structures, into society and into people's individual lives. Where things are broken and devastated and desolate, we want to rebuild those places. We want to build bridges where it seems that there is, is such disconnect. There's no way across between this chasm. We are called to build bridges and to see change. And we are called to create culture, to change values, to show new vision, a new way of doing things and to see lasting change. So Nikki and I sat down and we looked at three things that we can do to begin the process of change inside us. Rather than letting things unfold around us, or just sitting passively while others do the hard work of pursuing justice. We wanted to answer this question, what are the three things that we can do? Nikki and I, what are the three things that you can do as part of Skylark Church and the Skylark Church family? Today, all I can give you are some first steps to what is going to be an ever unfolding process. Nikki and I, prepared this together, but unfortunately for the last couple of days, Nikki's not been feeling very well. So everything I bring is on my heart and also on hers. We were supposed to be sitting next to each other today, bringing this to you. And what we thought was we would look at the life of Nehemiah and pull out three things that we can be doing right now to engage in the process of creating culture. And as I said, there are going to be plenty more steps to follow. We're sure of that. But as we get unfolding revelation, we want to bring you on the journey. We are not the finished article. There are so many things that we are clueless about, but we are desperate to learn and to move forward and to take us all on a journey. I know that many people at the moment have been saying, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. Hopefully this is going to help today. Don't feel condemned. Feel convicted. There's always something that we can do, always something that we can learn. But we're all on this journey together. So the beginning of the book of Nehemiah finds the people of God in exile in, in Persia. They have been taken off to Persia. Some have been allowed to go back to Jerusalem in the previous book, in the book of Ezra. But some are still in captivity. And this is a time where Nehemiah is the cupbearer for the king. So he's got a, a really important job. And some people come from Jerusalem and he asks them what's happening in Jerusalem. He hears the update of what's going on and his heart is broken. And he, he prays, he, he has a, a deep time with God and then he has a plan to go to the king. And the rest of the book is the unfolding of the story. It's really easy to get to the plan without going through the early process. We don't want to do that as a church. We want to learn these three things today right from the beginning in chapter one of Nehemiah. Let's have a look at those together. In verse two, it says this, Hanani, one of my kin kinsmen, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them about the surviving Jews who had escaped exile and about Jerusalem. So this is Nehemiah. He's got some people come to him. And he asked them about the surviving Jews who'd escaped in exile and all about Jerusalem. It's really easy to miss the very small phrase, and I asked them about. And the first thing we want to do 
Nikki and I and us as a church, is to ask. We need to adopt the position of a learner. You see, in asking, we have to say we don't have all the answers and we don't know it all yet. That is a position of humility. We need to humble ourselves. You see, we don't know what we don't know. But we certainly don't all have the answers and we certainly don't have a finished and perfect worldview. And humbling ourselves to become a complete novice is scary. It threatens our security. We like to be in the know on things. We don't like to make ourselves vulnerable, to leave ourselves exposed. It's like adults who learn to swim. It's a vulnerable place of threatened security. Being a complete novice is scary. It's like getting somebody to speak a foreign language out loud in front of the class. It's vulnerable. It's like Nikki and I when we've taught people how to sing out over others. Imagine this scenario. We've said to people, right, I want you to stand opposite somebody. And these aren't musical people. Stand opposite somebody, pray for them and then sing over them a love song from heaven. Oop. It's scary stuff. It's vulnerable because people are novices. They don't know what to do. They feel completely just out on a limb. It's okay for us to ask, to adopt the position of a learner, to humble ourselves and to say we don't know it all. It makes us vulnerable. It may make us uncomfortable, but we need to be okay with that. We need to get information. We need to educate ourselves. We need to engage in dialogue and in conversation. We need to be like Nehemiah and ask people about their experiences, ask people about their pain, their grief and their fears. We need to reach out to those who can help us to see what we may be blind to. Do you think we can do that as a church? We can just pause and ask, become learners again. In verse three, it continues, and they said to me, Dialogue begins. Nehemiah asks and the people say. This conversation has then kicked off. They fill him in. They help him to understand what he doesn't yet know. And in the concept of race, there is so much I don't know. In, in trying to understand my own white privilege, there is so much I don't yet know or understand. I'm going to ask some questions. Nikki's going to be asking questions. Let's be people who ask questions at this time to try to learn. The second point comes in verse 4. When I heard this, Nehemiah writes, when I heard this, the rest is coming but that's enough for now, let's pause there. We need to hear. And by that Nikki and I mean that we need to listen and understand. Listen and understand, that's what hearing is. To be able to empathise, to try to understand from somebody else's point of view. You see, there's a massive difference between hearing and hearing. Massive difference. Sometimes we can hear someone's story and be thinking about other things. And then we can nod sympathetically. Oh, yeah, that's terrible. What a nightmare. I'll remember to pray for you and be on our way, thinking about what we're having for dinner or something else. But actually, that's not what happens to Nehemiah. He hears this. He really hears and he understands the plight of the people in Jerusalem. Are we going to really allow what we hear to change us? You see, that's a different thing. That's a different level of hearing and understanding completely. We need to get into conversations. We need to read what we can. We need to find out how black people have been written out of our history. We need to find out all about the slave trade. We need to not just congratulate Wilberforce and, side, and sidle up next to him. You see, I think that we do that quite, quite naturally. And this is just an aside, but I've said it before, I think. When Jesus rebukes the Pharisees, when he tells them off for being too religious, I often stand next to Jesus and point my fingers too. And I've been challenged recently, go and stand with the Pharisees. I'm talking to you sometimes. And I think in, in this situation, when it comes to race and trying to understand, 
the systemic racism that there is in society, but that there is in my heart too, it's easy for me to say side with Wilberforce and say, yes, I'm with you, Wilberforce. We stop the slave trade, but I ignore the 500 previous years. And I need to actually be, I need to get into that part of the journey too. I need to understand that I am involved in the systemic racism in which I find myself today. And I have a part to play. So we need to make sure that we hear to understand the things that we don't yet know. And let's do that from a non-defensive position because it's so easy to hear and then suddenly for walls to come up for us to defend ourselves and our actions. We need to humble ourselves to ask the questions and we need to humble ourselves to hear and be changed by the responses that come back to us. Who can you have conversations with? What can you read? What resources can you get hold of? Who can you reach out to and get to know? And then the third part is to respond. And we've called this respond part one internally until I've got some notes on that one. But we feel like the first change that has to take place is a heart change. We can't go changing the world if our heart hasn't been changed because we'll never have the capacity, the motivation and the determination to keep going beyond a few weeks and a few tweets. We need some heart change. And in verse four, it says after he'd heard, he'd really heard the message from his friends. It says, I sat down and wept and mourned for days and fasted and prayed constantly before the God of heaven. This is a time for us to reflect. That needs to be our first response. Not a passive, relaxed reflecting, but to really deeply reflect on what is going on. To lament, to weep, to grieve, to mourn. And I am asking God to break my heart in this. You see, I have no problems Naturally, this is a confession time. For, for me, I find it easy to weep with joy. If I see a reunion, I will cry. If I see oppression, I get angry. Now, fair enough, my emotions are still responding in my natural way, but I want to learn to weep more and not just get angry because sometimes my anger isn't righteous. It doesn't lead to a righteous thought process or outcome. I want to reflect in this time and to lament and say, Lord, help me to weep, help me to grieve, help me to mourn. Can I encourage you to do the same? We're going to be engaging with God in prayer and in fasting like Nehemiah did. And then Nehemiah goes on to repent. He repents collectively on behalf of God's people. And we want to do that to repent on behalf of God's people, to repent on behalf of the church, to repent for what's gone on on behalf of the white church of the UK. But that's too distant, you see. That's too far away. I need to get it more personal. And what Nehemiah does is he repents personally for what's going on. I need to rep repent personally for the current situation. We need to let God break our hearts for the things that break his and the things that break other people's hearts. We need to ask God to point out our blind spots, our shortcomings, our pride, our prejudice. That's how we're going to respond, first of all, internally in our hearts. See, as he began to pray, he identified and confessed his nation's own failings and shortcomings. What can happen with is to us is that pride can make us want to other the blame. It's their fault. It's the system's fault. It's bigger than me. It's the government's fault. It's not my fault. Sometimes ignorance, ignorance makes us want to other the blame, push the blame out to someone else. See, Nehemiah wasn't directly responsible for the breakdown of the wall, but he understood, understood that he had a part to play. So we need to understand that we have a part to play too and to repent of our own shortcomings and to sit in the presence of God and hear his voice for the situation. We need to one, ask some questions and adopt the position 
of a learner. We need to, to, to hear, really hear and allow it to change us. And then we need to respond by allowing God to do an internal change with us as we sit with him, as we hear his voice, as we lament, as we grieve, as we weep. As we allow him to break our hearts. Hey, we've sung it for a long time. Break my heart for what break break my heart for what breaks yours. <laughs> Now's the time to allow that to come to the fore and to really mean it. And to allow him to point out our blind spots, our shortcomings, our pride and our prejudice. Because once those things have been dealt with, we're going to be able to move on. You see, there's loads more to draw from the passage. Loads more to draw from this book, but to do it now would be starting to move into a plan. You see, there's a plan that unfolds from chapter two and the rebuilding of the, of the wall starts, but we don't want to bypass this current place. We feel it's really important. If we're going to run the race for the long term, we can't bypass the listening. We can't bypass the learning and the unlearning that has to take place. It's only just begun. Break our hearts for what breaks yours, Lord. In the learning process, we need to read books. That takes time. You see, the justice theme of, of last year was just a departure point. And this is a continuation from there in playing our part in breaking down systemic racism. We want to go deeper than a flurry of acti activity now that doesn't lead to lasting change. We need to listen, to love, to understand, and to let God change our hearts because we still want to be running this race in the days, weeks, months, and years ahead until we see lasting change. So to the black members of our church family, we hold you close, we look after you, and we say that we are ready to ask to hear and to respond and allow God to change our hearts. And that we say to you that we love you and we are in this for the long haul. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pete. I don't know about you, but I feel I need to take a moment to respond to what I've heard this morning personally, as well as collectively, to our beautiful black brothers and sisters. This morning, we are surrounding you with love. And as we come and stand before God in prayer today, we want you to know that we are surrounding you, that we are holding you close, that we love you and we are embracing you. And as we pray, we ask that there would be a moment of encounter for you today with your dad in heaven, that you would know that you are loved and affirmed. For each of us, as I pray this morning, I'm going to invite Holy Spirit to help us to become those learners, to become those who listen and truly hear from others and from God. And that we would be those who respond in prayer, in repentance, in heart change, and in actions that will tear down the systemic racism, racism that we see embedded into the fabric of our society and our world. So let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that this morning you are here. We thank you for everything that we've heard from Pete, but also throughout the last few weeks via social media, in books, in resources, in news reports. It's clear, God, that you are doing something at this time and we don't want to miss what you're doing. So firstly, I pray that you would enable us to humble ourselves and to become apprentices as we follow you, as we follow your example. Jesus, you were someone who stood against injustice. 
You are someone who always reached out and built kingdom on the margins and brought everybody in. And so, Lord, today I want to pray that you would enable us to take that posture of learners, that you would show us how to educate ourselves, inform ourselves, how to be those who hear from others and learn from others' experiences. But also, Lord, that amidst every other voice that clamours for our attention, we would hear your voice today. We would hear you speaking to us, that you would expose the state of our hearts, that you would show us how to identify and how to expose those blind spots of pride and of prejudice in our own hearts, minds and lives. Would you forgive us, Lord, where we have let our black brothers and sisters down? Would you forgive us for our shortcomings, whether they are deliberate or whether they are entirely unintentional? Would you come and would you forgive us? And we pray, Lord, that you would show us how to respond well to what we're hearing as we embark on this process and continue on this process. We pray, Lord, that you would show us how to be a church that responds not just in word, not just in tweets, not just on social media, but who responds internally by allowing ourselves to go through the uncomfortable process of change. But then, Lord, outwardly, as we look to change things in our church, in our city, in our nation and in our world, would you help us to be those who advocate for justice, who advocate for the things that matter to you? And Lord, would we not rest until we see your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we said, we know that this is going to be a journey for us as individuals, but collectively as a church family. And so Pete and I have invited a dear friend to come and speak to us next week as part of our online service. Reverend Dr. Kate Coleman is an incredible theologian. She was the first black female minister to receive accreditation in the Baptist church. And she went on six years later to become president of the Baptist Union. She is passionate about leaders and raising up a next generation of leaders, but she's also passionate about the church. She's pioneered a church plant. She spends a lot of time teaching and unpacking truth to church leaders. She is a thought leader. And we are really privileged, delighted and excited that she will be coming to share with us as a church family next week as we continue learning and growing together as one. So please, that's one not to miss next Sunday. Next Sunday evening, we will have our prayer and worship Zoom. For those of us who have been able to join in so far, it's been a really significant time, a time to process, a time to receive from the Holy Spirit, a time to be encouraged and to pray for some of the things that we see unfold around us in our nation and in our world. I know that for others of us, it's been a real lifeline and I'm grateful that in particular, I'm just thinking of several people last week who were vulnerable enough to say, do you know what? I'm really struggling in my faith at the moment. And we were able to pray one for another. If you feel that you're missing that connection, I know Zoom isn't the same, but do join with us and we would love to encourage you to worship with you and to pray over you. Also, I am really excited to tell you that this week we have been very active when it comes to blessing people in our city and our community. Uh, it's one of the amazing things that since lockdown, um, although we haven't been able to perhaps do some of our community initiatives and outreach and all of the, the, the activities that we may have hosted from within the building and beyond, one of the things that we have been able to do is consistently bless people in practical ways. So this week we were able to deliver 14 food parcels to different individuals and households that needed them. We have also received two deliveries from a local supermarket, which we've been able to distribute to the Women's Refuge. We have also been able to drop off 50 love parcels, which the team honestly lovingly prepared, 
with cake and chocolate and other goodies to bless people and brighten their week. Thank you to each and every one of you who have given into our pastoral offering, but also to those who have been preparing and delivering those parcels. We know that for the recipients, they have been so valuable. On the 20th of June, we have a women's event coming up. It's going to be a Zoom call, time spent together as ladies in God's presence, encouraging one another and enjoying Holy Spirit's presence. So if you would love to join in with that, there'll be more details coming to you this week via Church Suites and it will be over and across our social media channels. Do join us for that. From Pete and I, all that remains to say, Church is stand firm, stand firm. I remember back in January speaking a message on into the unknown and I had no idea quite how uncertain, how unpredictable and how full of change 2020 would be for all of us. But I'm glad that God gave us a heads up and we are praying for each of you daily that your faith would stand, that amidst all of the change, amidst all of the unpredictability, you would take the hand of God and you would trust him with your future and that you would know that we are designed to flourish in these deep waters. There's a line in one of our worship songs that I'm going to leave us with this morning. In oceans deep, our faith will stand. Church, we're praying for you that your faith would stand, that our faith would stand, and that we would step into an unknown future with a God who knows us by name and who knows the way that we should go. Let's follow him well this week. We love you.